morning, everyone. Let's make our way into the sanctuary as we start this morning service. Welcome. It's a great morning to praise the Lord. As I was uh, meditating this morning, I came upon this hymn, and I think it's very appropriate in the first verse. Listen to this. It may be familiar to you. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Sing now in glad adoration. What an appropriate way to start off this service. We will in God's word. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting, in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome again. We come here to worship as we have already started to. We have a wonderful, mighty God. Do we persevere, saints? Do we hold firm? We do. It's a miracle, it's grace, it's all grace, but we do. So let's sing to our God who keeps us. Yet freely shown, no 
All we have is Christ. So our worship is only in Christ. It's only for Christ. It's pointing to Christ. It truly is all about Christ. And what a wonder that we can even worship him, that he has even saved us. Your grace. 
What an amazing love I see. What an amazing love I see. That your grace has come to me. Bye. 
Good morning. If you're visiting with us today for the first time, you may be asking yourself, why are these people singing so loud? Why are they lifting their hands? Why are they smiling? It's simple. We love Jesus. We love Jesus. Why do we love Jesus? Because he first loved us. God, is his, God has revealed his great love for his people in this, that he gave his only son. He gave his only son. Here at uh, this church, we like to remind you or tell you, if you're here, here for the first time, that we love you and we're excited that you're here. We believe that God has sovereignly drawn you here for a purpose, and that is for your ultimate and final salvation in Christ. We like to tell you that we love you, and we love you enough to tell you the truth. And the truth is that you're a sinner. But so am I, and everyone sitting in this congregation. But you can be saved from that sin by believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. That's what this service is about. That's what we've been singing about. That's what we're going to do right now as we uh, celebrate communion together, as we hear God's Word proclaimed later in this service. All of this has been going and moving in one direction to proclaim, hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen? This is the time in our service when we uh, have our, what we call our pastoral prayer, where we bring before the throne of God our needs and our concerns. Uh, after our prayer, then we're going to have the communion elements passed. If you are a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, and have trusted in Him alone for your salvation, you're welcome to participate with us. The protocol is simple. The trays will pass. There is a double cup. There's two cups. One has cracker on the bottom and the juice is on the top. If you'll take one of those uh, double stack cups and hold on to that, then in a moment I'll come back and lead us together and we'll partake communion together. But before that, let us, let us pray now together. Almighty and holy, merciful Father, we have erred, we have sinned, and strayed from your ways. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have followed too much our own devices, our own desires, the desires of our own hearts and not yours. We have offended you and broken your holy laws. We have left undone things that we ought to have done. And we have done things that we ought not to have done. There is no health in us. But you, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders, miserable sinners. Spare us, O oh God, as we confess our faults to you. Restore those who are repentant according to your promises declared to all of us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may from now on live godly, righteous, and sober lives to the glory of your holy name. We now take a moment to confess our sins, our private sins to you, even now. Almighty God, you are the God who does not desire the death of a sinner, but rather that he would turn from his wickedness and live. And Lord, because we have confessed our sin 
because of the greatness and goodness in your son, Jesus Christ, that he has taken our sin upon himself, we can know that our sins are forgiven. You have pardoned us. You have forgiven us. All of our sins, as we often pray and say here, all of our sins, past, present, and future, are taken care of because of the cross of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, blessed Holy Spirit, for making the reality of this known to us today. Father, we continue to bring our, 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 our request before you. Lord, we pray for our nation. Lord, it is, a, it is a trying time. It is a challenging time. We ask that you would do your work in this nation, that you would draw people to yourself, that people would know that their only hope for peace and justice is Jesus Christ. Lord, as your followers, help us to open our mouths and to proclaim the truth of the gospel to our unbelieving friends around us. May we be bold. May we fear you and not fear man. May we know that what can they do to us? What can they ultimately do to us? But f finally take our lives away, and then we've won. Because absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. We will just have crossed the finish line and be in your glorious presence. So, Lord, with this hope and this knowledge in our hearts, may we be bold, bolder than we've been in the past. Bold as we look forward to our heavenly reward. We pray for our leaders. We ask for righteousness. We ask for wisdom. We pray that you would take away their blindness to you and who you are. Father, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And so we pray that those fools who are leading would repent of their foolishness, that you would move in power, that they would confess their sin and they'd turn to their only hope, Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive us. When we speak ill of others, including our leaders, help us to pray for them and grieve for them and grieve for those around us. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation who need health and healing as well. Lord, you know who they are. Draw them to yourself. We pray for the Martinez family especially and Reuben's, Kathy's son. We ask for his healing and his strength, Lord God. We pray for others who need that power as well in their lives. And Lord, now as we turn our hearts toward this time of communion, Lord, may we rejoice in your Son as we remember his death and proclaim these things until he comes again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've said it before. I'm sure I'll say it many more times. This passage ends with what I think are the three most beautiful words uttered in any language. Let's read. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for those for, for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother 
and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, knowing that all was now finished, said, Jesus said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. It is finished. The work that God had set out for his son to accomplish, the mission was accomplished. Jesus is not saying, I'm dead. He's saying, it is finished. It's done. My mission is accomplished. Satan has been crushed. Jesus now will be resurrected in a few days and ascend to be reigning and ruling over this earth. It is finished. So friend, if you have not put your hope and trust in Christ, this is the day to do that. You can lay down. You can stop your laboring. You can stop your fretting. You can stop your sinning. And you can know it is finished. God has done the work for you. You can rest now in Christ. You can know true an everlasting peace that starts on the day of your salvation and extends into eternity. It is finished. And so with that, we now participate in what I call this little feast, a piece of cracker, a little cup of juice. The cracker or the bread represents Christ's body. The juice represents his blood. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 concerning these things. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Saints, take the bread. Jesus. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup. Father God, we are so thankful this morning for your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, for that great sacrifice that you gave for us of your own Son, for Jesus, your willingness to be that sacrificial lamb, to be the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Lord, we thank you for our salvation in you, and now we remember you in this time, and we will continue to do so until we see you face to face. We look forward to that feast, the wedding feast of the Lamb, when we all feast together with you in heaven. We love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have a, a, a brief time to drop off our children. If you would like to, if you have kids here who are fifth grade and down, they may go to their uh, children's classes. Children are always welcome to stay with us in the assembly, of course. Uh, but let's make this brief. Um, we've been doing a lot of fellowshipping, so tr if, if you don't have to leave right now, go ahead and stay in your seats, greet someone who's around you, and let's try to, to uh, make it a little briefer than we have in the last few weeks. <clears throat> God bless you. Good morning, church. Please make your way to your seats. We'll continue our service with a few announcements.
What a joy to come and worship the Lord together. Amen. It's been such a blessing already. So thankful for the songs that are chosen, for the, the labor that goes into thinking through prayers. It's a joy to be together with you all. We have a few announcements. First, we want you to be in prayer for our students, our youth, and our young adults who are going away uh, this Thursday for the, the loft retreat. So be in prayer for us as we just spend time together and seek God and uh, study his word together. So we're looking forward to that. Um, for those of you who haven't finished getting the rest of the amount paid for that and the forms for that, make sure you get that into me uh, before, before Thursday or on Thursday is fine as well. Also, we want to announce that we continue to need volunteers. So if you could open your bulletin and just look real quick at the, the various needs that we have. We need help preparing the communion elements on third and fifth Sundays. We need help greeting on the second Sunday. Bringing food on the second, third, and fifth Sundays. Serving food every Sunday. <laughs> Children's safety monitor. So that's for in the back to make sure that the children are safe and no cars are coming. Uh, first, second, fourth, and fifth Sundays. And so we're just asking you if you could prayerfully consider serving. Uh, if, if there's, you know, uh, opportunity um, that you're able to, to meet, we, we would be so blessed to have you step in and help with, with any of these. So uh, please consider those. Um, lastly, I just want to remind you that we have our Redeemed Women's group that's uh, meeting again. They're working through uh, the book of Philippians going through a Bible study then. That's at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays or also Mondays at 7 p.m. online with Zoom. So uh, be, feel free to take advantage of that and share your life with the ladies of our, of our church. Uh, as a reminder, we have our men's prayer in the Word on the first and third Saturday. So we just got together uh, yesterday. And that's, that's a joyful time together to seek the Lord and to, to pray and intercede for our church. Uh, so with those things said, though, um, we want to also just remind you, or for those who are new here, we have a plurality of elders uh, who serve in submission to the Word of God and by the power of the Spirit, uh, and who are held accountable by this church. And we, we seek to honor the Lord and, and preach through books of the Bible on Sundays. So for the most part, if you're here, we're going to be working through books of the Bible, and we have uh, a rotation of the pastors who will just preach. So you get to hear from a different pastor each week, um, but still working through the same book. So we're continuing our series through the book of John. We get to have Pastor Kenny preach the word to us this morning. But before we do that, let's please stand and worship God one more time and ask him to prepare our hearts to receive the preaching of his word.
your church built and the earth is filled with your glory by grace and by grace open your, we wanted to make sure that you were really awake. Good morning, church. Go ahead and open your Bibles to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And as you turn there, I remind you that beginning in chapter 7, the conflict between Jesus and the religious leadership of Israel is intensifying. But not only that, both the crowds and the multitudes along with the Jewish leadership are going to begin turning on Jesus. And what we have in chapters 7 through 12 is a focus on the mounting hostility between Jesus and the Jews, which then leads us to the famous upper room discourse of chapters 13 through 17, which would then, as you know, culminate in the betrayal, suffering, crucifixion, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John tells us in chapter 20, verse 31, that all these things are recorded so that you may believe. You hear me? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Our text this morning moves the narrative from the private encounter that Jesus has just had with his suspicious brothers in verses 1 through 13 to a public encounter that Jesus had with unbelieving Jews. Let's make it clear the context here. Jesus is no longer in Galilee, but he is in Jerusalem. And not only is he in Jerusalem, but he is in the center of Jerusalem at the temple. And he is not just in the center of Jerusalem at the temple, but he was there during a religious feast. Let our minds envision that. We could rightly say that Jesus' feet were squarely standing upon the center of Judaism, which was the temple, especially during religious feast. And it was at this place and during this time that Jesus the living word, responds to the escalating opposition toward him by proclaiming words of truth, which are recorded in the remaining verses of chapter 7. This morning we look at verses, 20, uh, verses 14 through 24. John chapter 7, verses 14 through 24. I invite you to now hear and receive the inspired and authoritative word of the triune God. He is the only true God, and this is his word. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, my teaching is not my own, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? 
Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Let us pray. Lord, the song that we sang is also our prayer. Speak. Through the proclamation of your word in such a way that Jesus would be exalted in our minds and in our hearts and in our lives. That you might be glorified as you alone are worthy of all adoration and honor and glory forever and ever. Would you grip us with that reality? That you are the Lord of all. You have authority to do as you wish. You are seated in the heavens and you do all that you please. Would that be a comfort and a confidence to your people? Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Authority. Authority. The term may be defined as the power or the right to give orders or to make decisions and to enforce obedience. Or it might be defined as one that possesses control in a particular sphere. Or perhaps even it might be defined defined as the influence over another due to one's commanding manner or their recognized knowledge of a subject. Authority. Authority. In this word, we hear the word author. And when we think of an author, we generally think of a writer, specifically a writer who composes or originates a document such that the produced composition can be rightly called his, can be rightly called his own, can be called the author's writing. If I authored a book, it would be mine in a different sense than if I were to go buy a book that was authored by someone else. The book that I authored would be mine in the sense that it originated with me. In other words, I, as the author, have authority over my book. What does this have to do with Jesus? Truly, truly the second person of the triune God. God the Son has authority in every sense of the word. He has the power and right to give orders, to make decisions, to demand and enforce obedience. He is the one who possesses control, not just in one sphere, but multiple particular spheres. He has influence over others due to his manner of command and not just his knowledge of some things, but his knowledge of all things. He has authority as he is the mediating origin of all creation. Where do I get this from? Let me remind you, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, all authority in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples, Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the triune God, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or to obey all that I have commanded. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22, he speaks of the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and powers and dominion and above every name that is named not in this age only, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head, authoritative term, as head over all things to the church, 
We also see this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Just listen to how Paul explains the Lord Jesus Christ to the church at Colossae. He says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And we remember Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that Jesus is the author of, and perfecter of our faith. Yet during his state of humiliation, during his ministry on earth, he appeared merely as a humble man. The outward manifestation of his glory was veiled, and as a man, Jesus, his authority was derived from his heavenly Father, who had sent him to secure salvation for his people by means of death on a cross. It's after the Lord Jesus' suffering and sacrifice that Paul tells us in Philippians chapter two that the Father highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But the circumstances of our passage occurred before the Lord's exaltation. They occurred during his state of humiliation. Nevertheless, our passage is indeed about the authority of Jesus. The main idea of of this sermon is just that, that our passage, John, in, in our passage, John identifies the authority of Jesus, the teacher, from which we can draw four necessary responses to the teacher and his teaching. You've noticed, I've put these four necessary responses in the form of commands. And I want to be clear on this, that these commands are for all people. They are both for true believers in Christ, and they are for those who do not truly believe in Christ yet. And let me be clear about that. You are in one of those two camps. You either truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, or you do not truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the good news is this, that these commands being for all people, can be yours either initially, for the first time, for everyone who has believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ has responded in this way. There was an initial time they did that for the very first time. It's being called born again, seeing Jesus as he truly is and submitting to his lordship and his authority. But for those of us who have already experienced that initial response, we do this repetitively. We do this constantly. We do this continuously. These four necessary responses are for everyone. So the outline before us this morning is you must rightly regard the teacher and his teaching. You must rightly reply to the teacher and his teaching. You must rightly receive the teacher and his teaching. And you must rightly rule regarding the teacher, his teaching, and his works. So let us begin with this first necessary response in in verse 14. You must rightly regard the teacher and his teaching. Verse 14 reads, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. We can't just fast forward through this verse as if it's just setting up the scene. I don't want us to miss the ironic and the implied authority of Jesus in this verse. What's going on? Jesus arrives fashionably late to the feast. And what feast is this? This is the Feast of Booths. We're told in chapter 7, verse 2, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. And remember that he's talking with his brothers, 
And then he tells them in verse eight, you go up to the feast, I'm not going to this feast. Let's pause there for a moment. Here at Redeemed South Bay, we believe what is called by theologians, verbal plenary inspiration. And what that means is simply this, that we believe every word of scripture is inspired by God and the whole sum of scripture is inspired by God. And so when we see little nuances, like Jesus saying in verse eight, you go up to the feast, I am not going up to this feast, I think it's wise for us to ask, why is Jesus making a distinction between the feast or this feast? Let's hold on to that because that's gonna be important. The feast versus this feast. Verse 10 says that he went not in public, but in private. Pastor Kevin helped us out last week, telling us that Jesus did not partake of the customary pilgrimage to the feast, which which helps us to understand the apparent distinction in part. But there's more to it than that. The Feast of Tabernacles both looked back at what God had done in the past during Israel's wandering in the wilderness, but it was also associated with the future or the eschatological hope of Israel's restoration. We see this in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. And this was one of the primary reasons that this was a celebratory feast, at least in the first century. But this is what we have to realize. There is no eschatological hope for Israel without the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, knowing that the nation of Israel would indeed reject him, says he is not going to this feast, the ones that everyone else was going to, because without him, there is no true feast of tabernacles. In other words, the only end time hope for the nation of Israel, and for every nation for that matter, rests squarely on the shoulders of Jesus. He is the one to be celebrated. He is the one who will fulfill the eschatological hope for Israel. So Jesus, yes, went to the same location as unbelieving Jews, but he did not celebrate the same feast. For without him, there is no feast. The irony is that during the Feast of Tabernacles, the God-man who is tabernacling in the midst of his people will not be regarded for who he truly is. We know from the prologue, and when we refer to the prologue, we're talking about the first 18 verses of John. And it's helpful as we continue working our way through the book of John to realize that John gives us this prologue to help us interpret everything that he says after the prologue. And so we know from the prologue that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What we don't pick up from this English translation is that the Word dwelt there is the same verb form of the word for tabernacle. And so when we talk about the Feast of Tabernacles, that's the noun, that's the thing, we're building and erecting these tabernacles. But what do you do in a tabernacle? You dwell in it, or you tabernacle in the tabernacle. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. As these Jews celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, the irony is this that it's in the middle of this feast that the glory of God returned to the temple, to tabernacle among them. Yet the ethnic people of God disregarded him. One One commentator said it this way, ironically, while the Jews were busy erecting their tabernacles in order to participate in the eschatological ceremonies of their God, God himself was tabernacling in the midst of his people. And he began teaching. And he began teaching. He doesn't ask for permission to teach. He doesn't merely show up at the feast. He arrived late and he began to teach. This act in the midst of the feast was undoubtedly a statement of his authority. Well, not explicit 
the ironic and implied authority of Jesus in this passage is present in this verse. The Jews responded with disregard. Well, some in the crowd said he was a good man. That lip service failed for fear of the Jewish leadership, as Kevin pointed out last week. They are an unbelieving people, unwilling to profess faith in Christ before the religious authorities. Thus, at this point, the major response to Jesus' authority was simply disregard. The question for you is how will you respond? How will you respond to the teacher and his teaching? I tell you that you must rightly regard both him and his teaching. He is the Lord of lords. He is the king of kings. He is the redeemer of mankind. He is the purpose of all creation, and you must regard him as such. You must observe him and take him at his word or you will have hell to pay for it. This brings us to our second response. You must reply, rightly reply to the teacher and his teaching in verse 15. Look with me at verse 15. The Jews therefore marveled saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? And it really shouldn't be a surprise to us that the Jews reply to Jesus' obvious assertion of authority. They marvel not in a positive sense. Let's not misunderstand this verse. It's not a positive thing that they're doing here. They marveled in a negative sense. It is probable that in their context, they are actually questioning Jesus with a legal charge. It's not that they're outwardly awestruck by his ability to teach. Rather, they're calling into question his status as a teacher, and therefore the validity of his teaching. See, rabbinic tradition would have expected a student to have been formally trained, formally taught by a respected rabbi, and then at some point, the one who was trained to be elected to be a rabbi in a formal teaching office. That was the expectation. And so from their perspective, Jesus was merely an uneducated wannabe. This uneducated wannabe threatened their establishment and their traditions. And they were amazed at a man who had such audacity to do that which was unspeakable in their context. Therefore, they replied to Jesus and his teaching by calling his authority into question. This is very important for you to hear rightly. There is a fine line a fine line between questioning Jesus and having questions for Jesus. There's a fine line between questioning Jesus and having questions for Jesus. If you have questions for Jesus, then join the club. So do I. That's great. His words are life-giving and his written word has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. So if you have questions for Jesus, let's grab some coffee and open up his book. But if you question Jesus merely because you want to hold on to your own traditions, if you question Jesus merely because you haven't experienced a miracle of some sort in your life, if you question Jesus because the immensity of his claims and his character don't align with your comprehension of who or what God should be, then be warned. That's the sobriety of preaching and presenting God's word. There are people before me who love Jesus and there are people before me who hate Jesus. And I want to cut that straight. I don't want to lie to you. You either love him or you hate him. And you need to be warned that eternity hangs in the balance. That your life is made and purposed for Christ and that's it. And if you're not warned, then I don't do my job as a proclaimer of God's word. Be warned. The fact that you are not already consumed by the righteous wrath of the Lord because of your rebellion, the fact that his patience is being extended to you even now, the fact that his grace is being extended to you as you are in the midst of his people, 
hearing from his word. These facts and more are gifts of God's grace toward you if you're not in him. And those gifts ought to cause you to reply rightly, rightly to Christ. The Jews replied with scoffing, with questioning, with legal charges perhaps. The question then for you is how will you respond? How will you respond to the Lord Jesus Christ? You must reply rightly to the teacher in this teaching. And the right reply is this. Yes. Yes. You are who you say you are. You are Lord and Savior. And by your grace, I will follow you till my dying days. Not only must you rightly regard and rightly reply to the Lord, but the third necessary response is that you must rightly receive the teacher and his teaching. You must rightly receive the teacher and his teaching. Look with me at verses 16 through 19. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If, anyone, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet, none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Here, Jesus replies to their reply by revealing the source of his teaching. You know what's better than being trained and having the stamp of approval by some respected rabbi? Having God the Father as the source of your authority and the validity, validity of your teaching. That's exactly what Jesus has. He's not concerned about what the crowds think about him. He's not concerned about what the Jews think of him. His confidence is in his father. Would to God our confidence be in our father as well? Jesus' statement would have been the exact opposite of what was expected. It would have been the exact opposite. That's not how they would expect him to reply. Surprise, surprise, Jesus does that quite often, doesn't he? See, the rabbinic tradition was something like this. Okay, there's a student who wants to become a rabbi, and so they follow a rabbi, and they learn from the rabbi, and they learn what rabbis have said before the rabbi that they're under, such that they're able to spout off, this rabbi thought this, this rabbi thought that, this rabbi thought that. But the up-and-comers did this. They taught from their own authority to try to make a name for themselves. They taught from their own authority to try to make a name for themselves. Yet Jesus claims that his teaching is of the one who sent him, not his own, which means the authority of God himself is expressed through Jesus' teaching. Do you hear that? The authority of God himself is expressed through the words of Jesus. Look at John chapter 5, verses 19 through 23. Remember what Jesus said. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Also in chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus says this, It is written in the prophets that they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me, Jesus says. We could boil it down to say this. If you hear from the Son, then you hear from the Father. Or if you hear from the Father, then you hear from the Son. 
But it is impossible to only hear from one of them. It is impossible to only hear from one of them. And Jesus highlights this reality when he says in verse 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. As the Jews challenge Jesus' ability to teach, he challenges their ability to hear. It is only those who have been born of God. It is only those who have experienced the new birth. It is only those who have had the, the new creation, been made new creation. It is only those who have been made spiritually alive. It is those who desire to receive the words of Christ as the very words of God in order that they might honor the Father and honor the Son in the same way. If anyone's will is to do God's will, it is because God has released their will from the bondage of sin. And this is why Jesus said what? In John chapter three, you must be born again to perceive or to even observe the kingdom of God. Later in the same chapter, he says, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And again, we're gonna refer back to the prologue. We have to remember chapter one, verses 11 through 13. He, Jesus, came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The outworking of being born by God. The outworking of being born of God is what? It is being willing to do God's will for God's glory. It is being willing to do God's will for God's glory. The one who is not born of God doesn't seek God's glory, rather he seeks his own. Verse 18, Jesus says, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. The rabbis, as I've already mentioned, did speak on their own authority for their own glory. Remember what Jesus says in chapter 5, verse 44. He says, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? And before we point the finger too quickly at the rabbis, it's good for us to acknowledge that at times we do the same. Speak on our own authority without knowledge. Seek our own glory. Trying to rob God of his glory. But this is not what man was made for. And this is not how we will end up if we are in Christ. He is at work in us to rid us of these things for his glory and for our good. One commentator put it this way. He said, the true goal of man should be to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the man that we ought to be. Jesus is what we are supposed to be, honoring God in every way, shape, and form. And that's why we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whatever you do, you can eat, you can drink, you can drive your car, I don't care what you do, do it to the glory of God. Jesus' purpose is to represent his father correctly. It's exactly what John chapter 1 verse 18 says. John chapter 1 verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, referring to the word that we spo was spoken of in chapter 1 verse 1. He, Jesus, has made him, God the Father, known. He has expounded, he has exegeted, he has shown us who the Father is, such that he can say to his disciple, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. He lived for his Father's honor, fame, and glory in his state of humiliation. That being the case, we can truly affirm what Jesus says in verse 18. For the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him, in that person, there is no falsehood. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there is no falsehood. We who are in Christ are being transformed 
2 Corinthians 3.18, from one degree of glory to another, such that we may be fully conformed into the image of Christ and wholly honor our Father. And when we understand that's the purpose of our life, and that it will be completed, that it will come to fruition when we see the Lord face to face, our prayer becomes, Lord Jesus, come quickly. After responding to the challenge that the Jews presented to Jesus, Jesus presents a challenge to them by abruptly saying, look what he says in verse 19, has not Moses given you the law yet? None of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? You see, the law of Moses says what? You shall not murder. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. But since their attempts to execute him are really attempts to execute an innocent man, it's nothing less than attempted murder. An effort to break the very law that they say they regard. So what Jesus does is he uses the law of Moses, which the Jews superficially espouse, to turn the tables and to show their hypocrisy and to show their inconsistency. Remember what Jesus said in chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. He says, for if you believe Moses, you say you believe Moses, but if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he, Moses, wrote of me, Jesus. But if you do not believe his writings how will you believe my words? If the Jews truly received the testimony of Moses, then they would receive the testimony of Jesus. Yet their hearts were far from God. Therefore, they did not receive Jesus, the, teaching, the teacher or his teaching. So again, we have to say that was then. What about us? What about us? How will you respond to the teacher and his teaching? You must rightly receive the teacher and his teaching, and you must do this by God's grace through the gift of faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I call each and every one of us for the first time or all over again to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ with the entirety of our being. If you have not called upon the name of the Lord, what time is it? Almost 11 o'clock? What's the date? April 18th? April 18th at 11 o'clock is the best time to call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Each and every one of you. You must, you must. Oh man, I'm fired up inside right now. I can't make it more clear to you. I warn you. There are people watching online, people outside. You must, you must rightly regard and reply to and receive the teacher and his teaching. You must. But there's a fourth and final necessary response. A fourth and final necessary response. You must rightly rule or must rightly judge regarding the teacher, his teaching, and his work. Look with me at verses 20 through 24. The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because... On the Sabbath, I made a man's whole body well. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Notice now in verse 20, it is no longer the Jews, but it is the crowd who interjects. This shows us that both the Jews and the crowds are beginning and becoming more unfavorable toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Earlier on in the gospel, there seems to be at least somewhat of a chasm. There seems to be somewhat of a contrast between the Jews and the crowds. But the contrast between the Jews and the crowd is slowly but surely dissipating at this point. And it will only intensify as we work our way through the gospel. It's even possible that the crowds are coming to the defense of the Jewish leadership here. 
They accuse Jesus of having a demon, which seemingly means in this context that they thought he was not well in the head. They seem to be asserting that he's experiencing paranoia and he is out of his mind crazy. As a matter of fact, the Jews will say in chapter 10, verse 20, that Jesus has a demon and is insane. Furthermore, they ask the question, who is seeking to kill you? They, they act as if no one is seeking to kill Jesus. But we've already been told in chapter 7, verse 1, he would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. We've been told in chapter 5, verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And at least to some extent, we have one dimension for their motives to kill Jesus. Chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus says, the world cannot hate you, speaking to his brothers, but it hates me. Why? Because I testify about it that its works are evil. In chapter 3, verse 20, we're told, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. And so they say, who is seeking to kill you, you crazy man? But Jesus does not answer the crowd's questions. He doesn't answer. Just like he challenged the Jews earlier in this passage, now he's going to challenge the crowds. He reminds them of their initial response to a miracle that he performed the last time that he was in Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus performed the healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda during his last visit to Jerusalem. We see that in chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. And this is going to be crucial evidence for the case that he is making against them now. He says in verses 22 and 23 of our chapter, chapter 7, Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the Father, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a whole man's body well? We know that circumcision precedes Moses in that Abraham performed it as a sign of God's covenant with him, Genesis chapter 17. Then it was later codified as Mosaic law, Leviticus chapter 12. And this was close to the same time that the Sabbath was codified as well. And so what do we know about the Mosaic law? We understand that under the Mosaic law, a boy was to be circumcised on the eighth day. So here's the question. If a boy was born and the Sabbath was eight days later, should he or should he not be circumcised? Circumcision preceded the law of Sabbath rest as both in time and in priority. And so this is one of the instances that we see when there are, uh, that in order to fulfill some biblical commandments, other biblical commandments are to be overridden, if you will. The question is, what commandment takes priority? And so Jesus is pointing out that the Jews circumcised on the Sabbath. That was customary. That's what you guys do. In order to uphold the spirit of the law, even though one might argue, according to the letter of the law, that the Sabbath rest was being broken. But what does Jesus say elsewhere about the Sabbath? Does he not tell us that the Sabbath was made for man? Does he not tell us that he is Lord of the Sabbath? And so his argument then is that if the Jews were permitted to care for one part of a man's body on the Sabbath, and it was not ruled as a violation of the law, then healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath was not a violation of the law either. That's the argument that he's making before them. But there's more. But there's more. And this is the big picture that we want to grasp the one who fulfills the law was present before their very eyes. The one who fulfills the law is present before their very lives. The one who Moses spoke of was there, not violating the Sabbath, but rather fulfilling it. And so Jesus points out their utter hypocrisy and says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. We live in a day when people arguing that any type of judging is bad. 
And I'm just going to let it be known, that's a lie from the pit of hell. That's not what the Bible teaches. So, yes, I understand we are not to judge fellow Christians in areas of Christian liberty. Romans chapter 14, we understand that. We are not to judge others without first judging ourselves. We understand that, Matthew chapter 7. But we are to judge sin in the context of the local church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, specifically verses 12 through 13, makes it crystal clear. We're not to judge outsiders, but we're to judge those who are in the household of God. Peter even says that, how, the, that judgment begins in the household of God. And our text calls us for discerning judgment between right and wrong. We are to judge. We are to have a biblical Christian worldview and look at the things around us and say, what does God say about this? And submit the entirety of our lives to the truth of God's word. Well, how are we to do this? That's the question. How are we to do this? And I simply want to read something that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, beginning at verse 11, for who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit interpreting spiritual truth to those who are spiritual. Listen now. The natural person does not accept, some translations will say does not judge, the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Our ability to discern right and wrong, our ability to look at the, the, the world before us and judge, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this in accordance with God's word? Is this in, is this in accordance with God's wisdom? Is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the living God dwells in you if indeed you are in Christ. And so as we study the word of God, the spirit illumines our heart, illumines our minds so we can understand the word of God and then walk out of these doors and apply it to the places that we're living. That's how we are discerned. That's how we are to judge. You see, these people in John chapter seven ruled wrongly regarding the teacher and his teaching and his works. Why? Because they were not of God. The natural person doesn't accept the things of God. What about you? What about you? Are you a natural person who refuses because of your own stubbornness, because of your own rebellion, to accept the things of God? Or by God's grace, have you called upon the name of the Lord such that his spirit dwells within you and you can say, ah, the purpose of my life is to live for God and he gives me everything that I need to do that through his word and through his spirit. You must rightly rule regarding the teacher, his teaching and his works. See, our text is a glorious text. And there's one thing that the people in our text got right. The Jews in the crowd were right to focus on Jesus. They just did so wrongly. We have seen four necessary responses to Jesus, the teacher, and his teaching on the basis of his authority. On the basis of his authority, we live in a day and age where we're our own authorities. That's what we're told. That's what we're tempted to believe. That's a lie, again, from the pit of hell. There is an authority over each and every person in this room and in this world. Those alive now, those who will be born into this world, and those who have already passed away. The triune God of the entirety of the, the universe is the authority of all things. All authority belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore you must rightly regard and rightly reply to and rightly receive and rightly uh, rule regarding the teacher and his teaching. You must. And if you don't, oh Lord, we need sobriety. Lord, help us to understand what weighs and hangs in the balance. If we don't rightly respond we will pay for all eternity 
for all eternity. And you will say, on April 18th, I was given an opportunity. I heard the word of God proclaimed. I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was in the midst of God's people. And I chose not to respond rightly if you're not responding rightly today. We forget what's at stake. We need sobriety. You know what we need in all honesty? We need to recapture the fear of the Lord. We need to recapture the fear of the Lord. That's what we need. We should tremble before God. Yes, I understand that I'm brought near to God and I've been reconciled to God. But listen, as we close to just a few things, we have to understand that Jesus came as a lamb and he will return as a lion. We have to understand that Jesus came as a servant, but he will return as a warrior. And so behold Christ now. Regard him in reverence. Reply to him in praise. Receive him by faith. Rightly rule that he is all that he claims to be and fear God, not man. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom. By the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Those are all pulled from the book of Proverbs. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell, is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Beloved, fear God. Submit to his authority and remember this. Remember Jesus' words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or to obey all that I have commanded you. And do not forget the last part. Lo, behold, I am with you to the very end. Lord, help us. Help us to do this for your glory, for our good, and for the well-being of those around us. We need to respond rightly to you. I pray even now, Lord, that your spirit would work in those who have been rebellious against you, who have not come to faith, and that you would give them new life in Christ now. For those of us who know you, Lord, help us to each and every day as we wake up in the morning, think about how we will will respond to you moment by moment throughout our day. Give us wisdom, give us insight into how we can honor you in every aspect of our lives. And Lord, we confess that we fall short, but the righteous man falls seven times and he gets back up. There are people in this congregation who have fallen, maybe even today, this week, this last month, this last year. Encourage them by your spirit, Lord, that their life is about you rather than about themselves. By your grace, help them, help us to humble ourselves before the authoritative, sovereign God of the universe and say, yes, you are both Lord and Savior, I will follow you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing to our great God, our King Jesus. Suffer.
the elders are up front to pray for you. If you have any need, any petition, any request whatsoever, I would encourage you to come and spend time, share your hearts with one of the elders and receive prayer from them. I was out of town last week performing a wedding ceremony, and so yesterday I listened to Pastor Kevin's sermon. He challenged us to say the J word. And as I was listening to his sermon, I thought to myself, why wouldn't we challenge one another to do that every week? So friends, brothers and sisters, tell someone you love Jesus again this week. If you didn't last week, God is gracious gracious, and he's given you another opportunity. Let's start a streak, not because we're works righteousness mentality here, but because what was just proclaimed from God's word is what we believe and eternity hangs in the balance. And we don't know who or what God will do if we simply say, this is my Jesus. Help us, Lord, to do just that for your glory. Have your way in us. Bless this precious people, Lord God. We are overwhelmingly thankful that Jesus is not just our savior, but he is our savior and our Lord and our King. And so therefore we want to be wise, faithful subjects of the King, wise, faithful servants of the Lord. And we want to revel in the reality that we have been saved. Help us to this end, we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you all.